Well, we are in the book of Genesis this evening, chapter 4. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, are those some of the new Bibles we have? Yeah, good. Those are some of the NLT Bibles. So you can slip your hand up in the air if you would like a Bible, and they'll be happy to get one for you. Welcome, each and every one of you. I am genuinely glad to see you. Uh, was praying today for you, asking that the Lord would bless our time together tonight and that the Lord would speak to each one of you and each uh, one of you in particular. He knows what you have need of before we even ask. So Genesis chapter 4. The word Genesis means origins. It's a book of first Things. Everything that ever started is found in the book of Genesis. In verse 1, we see the second generation of human beings following Adam and Eve. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. Now, these were the first two children of Adam and Eve. They had other children later on, but these are the ones that are recorded. And when Eve said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man, uh, her daughter is right up here in the third row. Thank you. When she said that, she probably, if you look up at me, this is not important. Okay, if you look up at me, we all look, okay, there she is, all right. Oh, I wish I wouldn't say things. I try. God knows. But you may remember back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, we have the first mention of redemption in verse 15, God said, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman. He was speaking to Satan and between your offspring and her offspring, that, person's, that person that would come out of her lineage, he will strike your head, speaking of what Christ would do to the enemy and you will strike his heel. So it's very possible that when Eve had this first son, Adam, excuse me, Cain, she thought, with the Lord's help. Now, at a minimum, we see that Eve was a restored follower of God because she's acknowledging that her birth, the birth of Cain, was directly related to God's help. And so she's giving credit to God She's praising God for the birth of her child. And she had her hopes that, oh, this is going to be the one, like God had promised, who's going to be the Redeemer. Now, as we're going to see, she was sadly disappointed. And so often in families, parents are so excited. They have a child or children and their infants and their little toddlers, and they hope the very best for them. They're so excited about having children. And they imagine, as any parent would, what this child will one day be. And many, many times, parents are sadly disappointed at what the children turned out to be. And such is the case with Cain. He became the first murderer. So the first child in the second generation, the first child born to Adam and Eve, became the first murderer. In verse, uh, the latter part of verse, or in verse 2, it says, Later, some unspecified time after, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions 
of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected or depressed. Why are you angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, No, for I will give, you, I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So Adam and Eve had normal relations as a husband and a wife. She became pregnant and gave birth to her first son named Cain. And then unexpectedly, if you will, she gave birth to a second son named Abel. And each of them pursued a different type of life. Uh, one became a farmer and one became a shepherd. And when it was time for the harvesting of the crops, we're told that Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord, and Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Much has been said by uh, Bible teachers as to why the Lord did not accept Cain's gift. Many people have said, well, he didn't bring a, a blood sacrifice as Abel did. It is the first act of worship that's uh, given to us in the Bible. Cain brought some of the offerings from his crop, but the Lord didn't accept his gift. And he became very angry and got very depressed. If you hold your finger there and go to the book of Hebrews, and we'll go back to Hebrews again later, Hebrews chapter 11, we find out exactly why the Lord did not accept the gift that Cain offered. Hebrews chapter 11. It's so neat to be able to look through the Bible. Hi, Daniel. It's so nice to look through the Bible and uh, see the answers to the questions that we have. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, we have information given to us about these two young men and their offerings. In verse 4, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. So we can deduce from that passage that the reason God did not accept Abel's 
excuse me, Cain's gift is because of the absence of faith. Abel came in faith. And the Bible also teaches us in the book of Hebrews that he that comes to God, in fact, it may be right there in the 11th chapter if you're still there, uh, maybe in verse 6, Hebrews 11, 6. Yeah, in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So it is impossible to please God without faith. So when we look back in Genesis chapter 4, the difference wasn't the fact that there was a bloodless sacrifice, but that, Abel, that Cain's heart was missing one thing, and that was faith in God. So he brought this offering without faith. Abel brought his offering with faith. And so we have right here in the very first part of the Bible, the first example of worship that is acceptable and worship that is unacceptable. So putting that in today's application for you and I, the only way that a human being can come to God and be acceptable to God is to come by believing, believing in God, believing in what God has revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. No one can come to God by offering their good works or anything else. The Lord Jesus said, no man can come to the Father but by me. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. So it is impossible to please God without faith. And so Cain had a bad attitude, which is demonstrated in these verses that we're going to look at in just a moment. And if you look back there to the end of verse 5, the fact that God did not accept Cain's gift, it says this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. So you also have here the first response the first rejection of God's correction. God was correcting Cain, and he said, well, I don't accept your gift. Now, what Cain could have done is he could have said, oh, okay, I see what you're telling me is that I need to have faith, and God would have said what? He would have said, yes, that's exactly what I want you to have. But, and we can assume that God told him that, but Cain rejected God's advice. And there are so many people going around today um, who are also rejecting God's advice. They, they will not simply come to God by faith in Jesus Christ, and they live very, very depressed lives. They're like people trying to fight their way out of a wet paper bag. Now, in verse 6, we see the grace and the tenderness of God as he tries to bring that correction home to Cain. He says, why are you angry? So not only was he depressed, but he was angry. And we're going to see how his anger was really towards his brother, which led to jealousy, which led to premeditated murder. But he said, why are you angry? The Lord, the Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected or depressed? You will be accepted if you do what is right. So you see that God was showing him. Now look, Cain, you will be accepted just like Abel if you'll do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. And so the Lord was laying out here the first instruction about the two ways a man can live. A man can live by going God's way, or he can attempt to live by doing it his own way. And at this point, Cain could have made an adjustment. He could have said, I see your way, and I'm sorry, I, you know, didn't know, made a mistake, was whatever it was, he could have repented, 
but he chose not to. And the Lord even told him, he said, watch out. If you go your way, watch out. And then the Lord explained it in the last part there of verse 7. He said, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you but you must subdue it and be its master. So he's saying, watch out, Cain. Sin is crouching at the door. He's giving him a, a mental picture of like an animal crouching, ready to pounce. So he said, watch out for sin. Watch out for going your own way. Watch out for not doing what I want. Sin is ready to pounce on you, but... He said, you must control it. You must subdue it. So now he's putting the stress back, not the stress, but he's stressing the point, Cain, you can do what is right. You can control yourself. Watch out if you don't. And Cain refused the correction of God, as so many do today. They, they refuse the correction of God. And sin, of course, is what stands in the way of our fellowship with God. It's always the, the issue. It's, it's, a, it's a barrier, if you will. So in verse 8, we see the, the actions now of Cain as he had already concocted a plan to kill his brother. And, and by the way, we see sin that first came into Eve and then Adam. Now it's spread into their to their offspring demonstrated by Cain's actions. People don't become sinners from without. It isn't your environment or your school or people that make you sinners. Sin comes from within, and you can prove that very easily by observing the behavior of a newborn infant. You give that infant a few months and a six, seven, eight months and a year, and you watch how that infant is going to act selfishly, jealously, angrily, etc. Who taught that child to act in such a horrible way? Nobody. It came from within. And so Cain is premeditating now to murder his brother. He deceived him. He lied to him. He said, let's go out into the field the fields, and while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother. Poor Abel, he had no idea. And he killed him, first murderer. And so the Lord came along in verse 9, and he said, where is your brother? And of course he knew, but he was trying to get Cain to admit his sin. And he said again, where is Abel? And then Cain lied to the Lord. He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian? He kind of spoke in a smart aleck way to the Lord. He said, what are you asking me? Am I, am I responsible for guarding my brother? And the fact is, you and I will either be our brother's keeper or we will be our brother's murderer. If we do not work to save others, we will be guilty of their blood. We have a whole human race around us. Are we responsible to that human race? You better believe it. God has saved us. He's given us the message of life. And it's, it's not right for us to do nothing to get the gospel out to the world that is perishing around us. We are our brother's keeper. That's why the Lord said, go out into the world and make disciples and to preach the gospel, to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the Lord asked him, what have you done? In verse 10, listen, he said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And so God was telling Cain that he could actually hear the blood of Abel crying out to him. In verse 11, the Lord began to give Cain the consequences for his sin, and he said, now you are cursed and banished from the ground in this particular area. You're, you can't live in this part anymore, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. 
From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Now, all of those consequences didn't have to come into his life if he would have merely said, okay, Father, I'll do it your way. But he wouldn't do that. He was stubborn. He was prideful. And as a result of that, he, ha he lost his relationship with God. He lost his relationship with his mother, with his father. And so not only did Eve give birth to the first two children, and here we have the first family born into the world, and there was trouble. And we see trouble in families all the time. One child murdered the other. Now Eve has not only lost her son Abel, but now her other son Cain is being banished and she'll never see him again. And he became a homeless wanderer and wherever he went, he had a very, very difficult time. In verse 13, we see the self-centeredness of Cain and all he was concerned about was himself. There was no repentance uh, for his sin. He said, my punishment is too great for me to bear. It's the first bit of emotion and passion that he demonstrates. He doesn't confess his sin. He only complains about his punishment. And we know many people who think the same way today. They object to the reality of hell, but they stubbornly continue in their sin. So you see all of these first things coming out here in the book of Genesis. Anyone who finds me said, they're going to kill me. He knew he was guilty. And then, of course, the Lord said, no, that's not going to happen. I'll, I'll give a seven times worse punishment to anybody who does. And then he put a cane, a mark on Cain, to warn anyone who might try to kill him and Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod. What is the mark of Cain? I have absolutely no idea. And I don't think anybody else does. But it was some type of a mark that when people saw him, they knew, leave that man alone. He did something wrong, but leave that man alone or you're going to be in big trouble. And John the Apostle, if you'll go please to 1 John chapter 3 with me for a moment, he speaks about these two boys, Cain and Abel. 1 John chapter 3, a wonderful passage beginning in verse 10. Welcome back. That's okay, he didn't get it. Welcome back. Thank you. Verse 10. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. Very, very important. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Plain and simple. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, absence of faith, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be deceived or don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. So you, you also see the first hatred here against righteousness. He looked over at Abel, he was accepted, and he hated him. So God's telling us, don't be surprised if the Lord hates you, if you're serving God and living righteously. In verse 14, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Now, do you love others or do you walk in hatred? Pretty serious question. Anyone who hates another brother or sister. Now, listen, let me pause here. I've said I hate you to people before. I, I would imagine, I'm sorry to say it, I would imagine you have too. We're not talking about 
a momentary slippage, if you will, losing your, you know, refusing to be in control. We call it losing our temper. We didn't lose anything. We just stopped controlling ourselves. You might say, I hate you. Well, you really don't. And the lady said, I don't really mean that. Well, then why'd you say it? Well, because I'm stupid in the flesh. But what we're talking about here is a person, their life. So if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. So back to Genesis chapter 4. Jesus was full of love and gentleness, wasn't he? May God work that in our lives. As you can see in verse 17, it says, Cain, and by the way, no doubt this whole story is where the expression raising Cain had its origins. There was trouble whenever we use that expression. They were raising Cain. We said, said it all our life and never had any idea what it meant. There are so many things we say like that. But Cain had sexual relations with his wife, which would, have want, which would have no doubt been one of the descendants of Adam and Eve. He found her somewhere. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son named Erad. Erad became the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael became the father of Methuselah. Methuselah became the father of Lamech. So you've got a great, great, great grandchild, I believe. His name was Lamech. And we see in verse 19, Lamech married two women. The first was named Ada, the second was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, who was the first of those who, first of those who raise livestock and live in tents. The Bedouins do that today. His brother's name was Jubal, the first who, of all who play the harp and flute. Lamech's other wife, Zillah, gave birth to a son named Tubal-Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. Tubal-Cain had a sister named Naama. One day, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. If someone who kills Cain is punished, seven times, then one who kills me will be punished 77 times. So we see not only the progression of the human race, the beginnings of different skills and agriculture, musical abilities, the forging of iron and steel, but we also see the multiplication of wives, where back in Genesis 2, the Lord indicated, for this reason shall a man leave his father and my wife, mother, and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But what the other thing that we see that's really important is the attitude of Lamech, the sin that spread now, it's spreading. And Lamech put himself in the place of God, and he kind of said what God had said to Cain, hey, anybody who kills you, I'll I'll punish them seven times. And he said, well, if that was the case, anybody who tries to come after me for murdering this young man who attacked me, I'll, you know, punish him 70 times seven. And so we see now pride coming out. And this is the spread of sin. In verse 25, we go back to Adam. It said, Adam had sexual relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to another son. She named him Seth, for she said, God has granted me another son in place of Abel, whom Cain killed. How wonderful this must have been for her to have another child. When Seth grew up, he had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, people first began to worship the Lord by name. So we see another first, and that would be mankind as a whole, 
they began to worship the Lord by his name. There was some degree of understanding they had about God's person, and men began to worship the Lord. This is the written account of all the descendants of Adam when God created human beings. He made them to be like himself. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and called them human. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these genealogies except for in verse 21, when Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived, notice, in close fellowship with God for 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. Now, uh, he walked with God. He walked in close fellowship with God. He lived, but he also walked with God. And this teaches us the important thing in Enoch's life, and that was fellowship with God. And fellowship with God should be the most, should be the most important thing in our lives, fellowship with God. He wasn't a mere talker, but he was a walker. He walked with God. He lived in unbroken fellowship with God for 300 years. He didn't visit God now and then like on Sunday, but he was constantly walking with God. This is not an easy thing to do, is it? It's not easy to do that. to remain in unbroken fellowship for 300 years. Yet the Holy Spirit can enable us to accomplish this. Continued fellowship with God is what we should aim at. We shouldn't be satisfied with anything short of it. When we study the life of Christ, he said, I'm constantly listening to my Father. When we listen to the Apostle Paul, 30 years after his conversion in Philippians chapter 2, he said, the thing that I'm all about is that I might know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. 30 years after he was born again, he said, the main thing is I want to know the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You make him the first priority in your life consistently. This isn't legalism. This isn't a burden that is heavier to bear. This is a life that can be lived and can be sought after. Some people say, well, you know, uh, my job won't allow it. My surroundings won't allow it. I've got so many things I need to do. Well, Enoch had to care for a family. He had children. Yet he kept up his work with God. No business or the cares of our life should make us forget God. A close relationship with God will keep us what? Safe. If we walk closely with the Lord, we're going to be kept safe. He becomes our comfort. He becomes our delight. It is our honor. It is the crown of our life to walk with God. Fellowship with God should be more desirable than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Enoch was happy. He enjoyed his life. The long relationship that he had with God ended in his being taken away from the earth without dying. God just took him home, so he never died. In the book of Hebrews, again, it speaks about Enoch who was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him and he was commended for the fact that he was pleasing God. So here was a man that pleased the Lord. If you go to chapter 6, it says, then the people began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as wives. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, 
their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth, for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them, but, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So men began to multiply on the earth. Let me get my shirt buttoned up here. You know, when people get old, they do all kinds of weird things. Weird things just seem to happen to them, don't they, Gene? Thank you. just want to dip, pivot away from myself. Thank you. We're all back. So people were marrying. People were, excuse me, they were multiplying. Daughters were born to them. Now, this interesting little thing in verse 2 the sons of God, which is typically used to refer to angelic beings most generally in the Old Testament. But I'm not going to try to tell you who these sons of God were because I'm not convinced of what they were. I'm just going to take what is said here, and I know that they're mentioned over in the book of Numbers, and there's all kinds of theories about angels inhabiting uh, people, demon possession. There's Second Peter chapter 3 talking about the angels who left their first estate are now being kept in chains, reserved unto judgment. I, I really believe all of that, but I don't necessarily know exactly who these Nephilites were. I don't really care. All I know is this, that the main part of this text has to do with human beings who became completely evil and wicked. So we see that sin is spreading but we keep seeing grace. When Adam and Eve sinned, God covered them with animal skins. God gave Eve another son, Seth. God even was gracious towards Cain and protected him, even though he suffered the consequences. God took Enoch up. And in here, we see that out of the whole human race, one man found favor in the eyes of God. So the sons of God saw the beautiful women and they took any they wanted as wives. It was a free-for-all. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time. So the Lord was fed up with what was going on. He limited human life now from being up in the seven to eight to 900 year range that the lifespan would be no more than 120 years. Verses, verse 4 gives us more information about these giants and so on and so forth. I don't really know who they were, and I don't think it's that important. Some Christians even believe these were people from outer space. But what is important is in verse 5. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw, please notice, that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Now, can you imagine that? Everything they thought and everything they imagined was consistently evil, totally evil. You and I have thoughts that come into our mind, but hopefully we banish those thoughts right away. Imagine every human being on the face of the earth, every thought they had, every thought, not just occasionally, but every thought was evil. Every imagination 
was completely and totally evil, and it broke the heart of God. God was just sad. It grieved him. It was a terrible, terrible thing that happened. And you know, it's really about the same thing today, isn't it? Mankind, it is still true for all of us, the wicked thoughts that we have, the evil thoughts that we have, they came from somewhere. There's always a blessing, and the blessing is found in verse 8. But... Noah found favor with the Lord. So here we see that in the midst of God's judgment, which was about to come, the Lord remembered his mercy. Even in punishing sin, God remembers Christ and all those who are of his family. The distinction here was made as the result of grace. It is not said that Noah deserved to be, to be saved, but that Noah found favor or grace. He didn't do anything to make himself exceptional, but he found grace from the Lord. And that's what's happened to you if you're saved. Where were you when you got saved? Where were you when you were you? And you were doing what you were doing. You weren't seeking after God. I wasn't seeking after God. But all of a sudden, you found grace because God was gracious to you. I found grace. And I began to think about God. And step by step, you know, Jesus said the new birth is a mystery. Think of the steps that led to your conversion and your salvation. You found grace. God gave you grace in the midst of the life you were living. That's why when we get to heaven, <laughs> we'll be, Jesus will always be the center of attention because he is the one who saved us. He gets all of the credit. He gets all of the glory. So this is the account of Noah, verse 9, and his family. Noah was a righteous man. So two things are said about him. He found favor or grace with the Lord. He was a righteous man. He was the only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. So it, nothing is said about his wife or his three sons or their wives as far as their attitude. He was the only person who was considered upright. And he walked in close fellowship with God. So you have that now in Enoch and you have it in Noah. In close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. That's another indication of what life was like. Not only their thinking, their imaginations, but it was violent. They were taking wives and whatever they wanted. God observed in verse 12 all of this corruption in the world for everyone on everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yet, yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. I'm going to destroy every human being, every animal, every bird, every creeping thing along with the earth. He told Noah in verse 14, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct the decks and stalls throughout its interior. 
make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant or my promise to bring salvation with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you and keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive and be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. And it took him 120 years to build the ark and there was no measurable body of water to be seen. But you can look at his life. He had found grace with the Lord. He was a righteous man. He was blameless. He walked in close fellowship with God. And he was then obedient. There was no question about it. The Lord said, this is what I want you to do. And he became, as the Bible teaches us, a preacher of righteousness. For 120 years. And he knew what was coming. When everything was ready, chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the boat with all your family, for among all the people of the earth, I can see that you alone are righteous. Take with you seven pairs, male and female, of each animal I have approved for eating and for sacrifice. That would be their food. And take one pair of each of the others, also say, take seven pairs of every kind of bird. There must be a male and a female in each pair to ensure that all life will survive on the earth after the flood. Seven days from now, I will make the rains pour down on the earth, and it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the face from the earth all the living things I have created. So Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. He was obedient to the Lord. Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. He went on board the boat to escape the flood, he and his wife and his sons and their wives. With them were all the various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and for sacrifice and those that were not, along with all the birds and the small animals that scurry along the ground. They entered the boat in pairs, male and female. God arranged that to happen, just as God had commanded Noah. After seven days, the waters of the flood came and covered the earth. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted. God opened up the earth and these water, these caverns that were filled with water they began to erupt from the earth and this, the rain began to fall in mighty torrents from the sky and the rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. That very day, Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, along with birds of every kind. Two by two, they came into the boat, representing every living thing that breathes. A male and female of each kind entered, just as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord closed the door behind them. For 40 days, the flood waters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the boat high above the earth. And let me just pause here for a moment and say how horrible it must have been once the door was closed and the water began. They mocked him and mocked him and mocked him for 120 years. But then all of a sudden, the rain began to come 
floodwaters began to come. People would have been screaming by the hundreds, by the thousands around the boat. Imagine how they must have felt inside. And there was nothing they could do to get these people in there. Not a thing. But they wound up being saved. And if you and I are to be saved from the wrath that is coming, we need to submit ourselves to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Noah submitted himself to God. It isn't our obedience that saves us. It is our faith in Christ that saves us, and faith is submission to God. John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, who has warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? He said, the axe is already ready to go into the roots. Who warned you to flee? God warned Noah. Jesus is our ark. If we're in Christ, we are safe. We're not saved by keeping the commands of God, but if we have true faith, we shall prove it by following the Lord's direction. If anyone wants to follow me, let him pick up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And so, verse 19, finally the water covered even the highest mountains on the earth, rising more than 22 feet above the highest peaks. All the living things on the earth died, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the people, everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living thing on the earth. People, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the sky, all were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him in the boat, and the floodwaters covered the earth for 150 days. And if I'm not mistaken, Jiggs, wasn't it a year that they were in the boat? I think it was about a year, wasn't it? A little, just a little over a year. The, the rain was for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, the highest mountains, I just saw it on the, uh, the Planet Channel there the other night. Um, I think they're in the Himalayas. So the, feet, the water was 20 feet above that. And it took a long time for the water to subside, and we'll get into that next week. Um, the wrath of God is coming. And the good news of God is that people can be saved. And people who are saved evidence their salvation by the way that they live. Right? Yes. Thank you. It's the truth. Well, my friends, we covered chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and we threw in an extra, chapter 7. How about that? So, thank you. Let's pray. And I'm not sure who's doing announcements tonight. Anybody? Jigs is. Okay, let's pray. Well, Father, thank you so much for your word. It's so simple and so profound, and it cuts deep into our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would take hold of our lives. We want to be in fellowship with God and to walk in in close fellowship with God. Thank you for every person who is here tonight. Bless them, we pray. May we all find grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.